MPH Sports Podcast. Talk sport and property with sports people discussing their careers and how property played a part in it. Ian Dowie, welcome to Talk Sport and Property. How are you doing, mate? I'm very well. How are you? I'm really good. Well, look, welcome to our podcast. You may not have listened to our podcast before. Basically, it's broken down into two halves. The first half, we talk about sport and your career. And the second part, we're going to talk about property. But before we go into your career, I just want to publicly thank you, actually, because as the the new business director of Alexandra Gray Solicitors, you've been doing some fantastic work with us and our players. So look, if anyone's listening to this pod and needs a good conveyancing solicitor, how would they get in touch with you? Yeah, we well, can get on LinkedIn or they can get on my email, which is id at alexandergrace-law.co.uk. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, also, to be fair to you, you've, you know, uh, I've been in football a long, long while and, you know, the, the bits and pieces you're coming up with, the players to use you, is a, it's a really good way of doing it. It's not beyond anyone's expense. You do a lot of diligence with it, you look to care for them, you know, make sure you look after it. So, between us, we're, we're doing a good thing both ways, and, and particularly you for making sure there's a little bit of income when who knows what comes around the corners for footballers at the moment as well. Oh, thank you. But that's really kind of you to say. No, that's so. true. Well, look, we're going to talk about your career. So, born in Hatfield, yep. Hertfordshire, not a million Correct. miles away yeah. from myself, 445 no. career appearances and 116 goals, 59 caps for Northern Ireland, scoring 12 times. I mean, considering you were still playing non league at 23, I mean, these stats are, these stats are really impressive. Well, uh, listen, I've got to say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say my playing career is defined by goals and, you know, could certainly have been a better finisher and worked harder at finishing. You know, a lot of what I was very good at was being combative, being workmanlike. You know, listen, I, I tried to make the best of what I've got. It's always difficult when you're playing catch up. You know, when I was released for Southampton as a 16 year old, it was a big blow to me, but found a way for playing for Southampton at Wembley many years later. So I've really enjoyed the career. I wouldn't change it for anything. The non-league experience before I played was brilliant. I can still name most of the 11 lads I played with in, in, in my Hendon team before I moved pro and still on a, on, a, on a group with them. But yeah, I went on and, you know, to play for Northern Ireland because I spent a lot of time there as a, a youngster. My mum and dad are both from there. Spent a lot of time, you know, in Belfast, at, you know, in the Donegal Pass and Takes Avenue Bridge and, and, and around that area. Yeah, you know, there's lots of things I could have done better. Lots of, you know, in, a, in an area, let's be honest, we, we had a, Probably there's a few too many beers happened at the time. If that's that's just the way it was. So, although we trained incredibly hard, if it, some of the professionalism could have been better at times, and that's not training. We trained full out, but full out after a night out is not quite the same as full out when you think. So, lots of things you regret and, and learn about, and now that you think about some of the managers and Harry Harry Redknapp or something at times would have been pulling his hair out, and you, you think about that. But you know, there's some things you can't change, and. Um, Looking back, if you, you, you realise you could do that different. But yeah, I've enjoyed it. And to play for my team, I've supported as a boy and, and actually the best team in London as we speak now. I mean, Chelsea will be there temporarily, but we'll soon go above them. So West Ham was a special thing for me. So not too bad. I would like to have done better and could have done better maybe. But yeah, well, I've enjoyed it. Good. Well, I'm going to take you back to 16 when you did face yeah. your sort of first taste of rejection at yeah. Southampton, as you mentioned. You decided to go to university and not only get an engineer's degree, but you also were employed by the British Aerospace. I mean, I guess education was suddenly a priority over sport at that time of your life, was it? Yeah, well, listen, my, my dad was a dad and mum both were, had a great belief in education. And, you know, what was very serious was, was much as I played football and was at Southampton before I was released. Mum and dad were very good at it. Dad was a grammar school chap from, from Belfast, very well read, very diligent, expected good things of the boys. And, you know, we, we just followed his footsteps, really. So, yeah, very much so. That I applied for a, actually, in the end, British Aerospace sponsored me through my degree. So, you know, I, even when I did my, even when I did my master's. So, it was, a, you know, it wasn't, it was nothing. It was like, so I think, £500, maybe a year or £500 a term. I can't remember any. It just helps you out a little bit. It was nothing. You know, because I was getting a grant then from being living at home. And, and so it worked out all right. You know, my mum looked after me and it allowed me, you know, as I got a bit later in my degree and started doing my master, I was playing good level at non-league and in the end at, at sort of Hendon getting, you know, which helped me help me grow St. Albans initially in Hendon, which sort of supplemented my money. So, yeah, just to, just to help out a bit. So, yeah, it was a really enjoyable time. Very different now. Very different game then. Very ferocious very aggressive 
lot of good centre halves who would let you know what the game was about. And if you if you wilted, you wilted. If you didn't, you had to you know to stand your ground. So it was it was a good game. In it was a really a grooming thing for me that my brother played at a lot of the clubs I was at, and he was a yeah. top draw centre half at non league, one of the best there was. So. You know, it was handy. And then in the end, when I Hendon sort of moved on, I grew. He ended up coming to follow me afterwards. But we had, we had a we had a, an outstanding team at um, Hendon when I was getting near the end of it. And you think about Phil Gridlett, who played pro, Dermot Drummer, who's at Arsenal, long, no longer with us, tragically committed suicide, which is terrible. You know, Phil Gridlett, Erskine Smart, Roger Way was at Spurs, Gibbo, Colin Tate, a top player. Davy Root, the keeper, you know, the, mm. the team goes on. My brother played for us. We, we had Alan Campbell, one of the best centre-halves in the league. We had good players, then Ronnie Duke and Ted Hardy, the manager and assistant manager. Ted Hardy, the manager, Ron. They were top players. Um, you know, Ted was a legend, but mm. we, 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 we had a great spirit and went on to great things and got to the third round of the FA Cup. I'd got, I think, 10 goals in the FA Cup that year and 33 goals for Christmas. And then I moved on just well, after that, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, you speak so passionately. You, you clearly had a fond time at Hendon. At Hendon, you were picked up by Luton Town. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, I mean, listen, I had probably, I think, four clubs. I had Chelsea, Doncaster, Sheffield United and Luton yeah. all in. And actually, the chairman, Charles Geary, wanted me to go to Doncaster because they were offering 60 grand. But anyway, I, I ended up going to Luton. It was a really good choice. More by luck than judgment, really. I mean, there was, you know, because Chelsea wasn't a massive side then, although bigger in terms of reputation. Mm -hmm. Sheffield United, I went up there, played two games for them, got a couple of goals in two games against Liverpool and Wolves in friendly. So Harry Red, uh, Harry uh, Bassett was quite yeah. tr kind of tricky. He was offering me less than I was going to be paid at work. So in the end, I signed for Luton. It was brilliant because I walked into a club with Steve Foster in there, Mick Arthur, Danny Wilson, uh, Mal Donerkey, uh, Ricky Hill, uh, David Priest, a lot of good, uh, let's see, a lot of good ex-pros, Ashley Grimes, you know, so you couldn't, they run the dresser in the right way. It was a disciplined environment. We played hard, but we, we trained hard. It was a good grounding for me. And in lots of ways, because Luton had a plastic pitch at the time, that allowed me to sort of catch up technically. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I went out every afternoon and, you know, under the guidance of Mick after a little bit of times, you know, we, we'd do some little drills on the plastic pitch and he'd help me with it. That would help me sort of pick up the technical ability. So, yeah, it was really good. Ray Harford, who's no longer with us, God bless him, you know, went on to win the Premier League title with Kenny Dalgleish at Blackburn, was magnificent with me. And then uh, it was it was a really, really and I had a few years, really, really enjoyed it. And so um, it was a special, special time. Yeah, well, I, I can tell. In March of 1991, the season you decided to join West Ham United in a yeah. £480,000 move. I mean, you were yeah. only there for, for six months and then you were ironically agreed, a move to Southampton. Can yeah. You can you explain sort of both No, moves? well, yeah, I can, I can explain it very clearly because I went there, listen, Parry, so I go there, Billy Bond's a manager, big signing, if, if you like, you know, at the yeah. time. My club loved it. I've done well. I've got five goals in 10 games, so at the time, one in two. Pre-season, I went to South End, pre-season game. Bonzi pulled me aside before the game. He said, he's not playing today. I said, why is that? He said, I've agreed a fee with Southampton for you. I think it was 6.50. I think so. Anyway, as, as I remember, yeah. I think. Anyway, I said, well, I don't want to go. He said, well, no, 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 the deal's done. So anyway, the way it was then, you didn't argue. And I said, well, my wife I said, listen, I'm on my way to Southampton. She said, well, we don't want to move and all that, So which we didn't. But anyway, we went there and had a fantastic time there. But, you know, that season, Southampton played West Ham at home. I think fifth last game of the season. I scored the goal for Southampton. West Ham lost 1-0 and West Ham went down. Wow. And, and the first person to come up to me was Billy Bonds, who said, Ian, you've done brilliant today, well played. And I said, well, listen, I'm gutted. No one, I never, West Ham's my team. He said, I know it was. He said, I only sold you because I needed I needed money. We had to get some money really? in. So it sort of brought, brought home start. And, and for him, in that dark moment, to come to me and say that was, was, you know, so now I look back as a manager, I've got a lot of respect for Billy for doing that. And I understand it. He needed that funds. And at the time, not even for a player, I think just to keep the club going. So, mm. you know, at the time, it's what it was. And then I was fortunate to go back under Harry. But so I got to Southampton. It was great. You know, we had we had so many big characters. Glenn Cockrell, Mickey Adams, um, Neil Ruddock, Tim Flowers, Letizia Shearer, Franny Benali, Jason Dodds, Tommy Williams from Neil Madison. You know, incredible. Neil Ruddock, incredible people. Really strong dressing room. Dressing room that run itself. Diligent, hardworking. Always stayed in the Premier League. Would never 
to be beaten. Weren't the greatest side at times. Different managers, Ian Bramford, were very, very tight. Alan Ball came in late and tried to introduce a bit more free-flowing style. And then I moved on when he was there. But you know, at the time, for the time I was there, we were we were resilient and, and you know we were never going to go down. We had a real, you know, we had some great characters and some great times, great trips and and some big, big victories. Yeah. And most of them was most of either, either Shirley Shear in his early early days before he moved on, or or Matt Letizia, uh helping us out of the mire with a some wonder goal, which he did time and time and time again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you spent five successful seasons at Southampton. Obviously, you know, competing for places alongside, you know, Matt Letizia and, and, and Alan Shearer. And as a football fan, you're just looking and thinking, well, wow, you know, these are these are two sort yeah. of, you know, Premier League icons. Well, what did what did you learn about them individually? Yeah, they're so they're different characters, no no doubt. Matt was technically one of the greatest players I've seen. You know, the, the ability to be able to. And, but people do say he wasn't fit. That's a load of rubbish. He could run all day. He was, he's quite good, actually, his fitness wise. His energy is really good. He's a really good golfer now. And it's sort of, he's, he's had that languid style. You know, when you when I when I got the ball, you play with him. Get it under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's miles better than me. So when you get when I got the ball, I got the ball, got it under control, got it got it out wide, and got in the box. He just yeah. took his time. There was a more yeah. languid style to him. He, he bet the the game came easy to him. Now Shearer was young at the time, fiercely competitive. Would fight anyone in terms of you know phys- physicality, great athleticism, rocket launcher of a right foot. I mean, mm. rocket launcher, find the corner unerringly, brave as a lion in the air. So different different ways, both with immense talent. I mean, Alan to score the number of goals he scored to become that super confident player is amazing. And given he scored all them goals without ever playing at the very 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 top, you know, outside. I know he won the Premier League title, but you know. And a couple of seasons where United were up, the show, uh, Newcastle United were up there, but you know, never to play in championship winning teams, loads other than Blackburn, was immense for him to get the number of goals he had. And will he be caught? It'll take some doing with with Harry Kane, who's the closest to do it. But shows what sheer spirit and desire and immense talent. Don't ever un- underestimate Alan Shearer as me- as mentally as strong as there is, finds a way to get it get the job done. Mm. And Matt. You know, people will say, oh, should he have moved on? It was easy to say. I think Matt could have played anywhere, as could Alan, clearly. But, you know, he, he, we won't look back now. He's played for a club. They adore him there. And, you know, his, his goal reel is the stuff of, of dreams for people. Yeah, listen, we found it easy. I went for on goal, hit the target. He went for on goal, want to hit it in the right in the postage stamp. And he believed he could do it. Was he like I that in training as well? It. Yeah, yeah. I'm staggering. I mean, he used to, we used to drop a ball on the halfway line. He said, where do you want it? The lad say crossbar. I'm not being funny, but halfway like six out of ten times he did the crossbar. That's honest to God. It's not be it's not they're, they're not pie in the sky. Six out, over fifty percent he did the crossbar. Staggering technical ability. Unbelievable. Well, in January of ninety four, ninety five season, you joined Crystal Palace for four hundred thousand. Yeah. Was this was yeah. this the right move for you? Well, I think so. You know, I mean it's, it's, I think it was a difficult time because they were under all sorts of problems. Mm. We had a really good, we had a brilliant run in the FA Cup. You know, we got to the FA Cup semi-final, but ended up getting relegated. You know, Ray, Ray Houghton came. Probably me and Ray came a little bit late. I got a few mm-hmm. goals for them. They hadn't got a lot of goals. I got mm-hmm. a few goals, probably not enough. And then started the, the following season really well, but then they sold me, moved West me on Ham. to West Ham. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, um, Alan Smith was there, good, really decent fella. You know, it's a good players. Chris Coleman, Gareth Southgate, Richard Shaw. Um, you know, Chris Armstrong, you know, good players should never really gone down. We just couldn't get it going. I think the FA Cup run and mm. we got the semi final, got beat by Man U, were a little bit mm. took a bit of the, sh- the sheen, if you like. So, yeah, disappointing, but I feel we should have maybe done a bit better, if I'm honest. Um, so, a disappointment, but a good bunch of lads and friends I'll keep. Really enjoyed it there, though. Really hospitable bunch. You know, John Salaka, another good player, was there, a lot of good people. Um, so, yeah, but we. Yeah, so close, you know, I, I missed a chance in the dying seconds of the FA Cup to equalise that Ray Houghton never, never lets me get with it because he crossed it and I missed it with a header at the far post. But, you know, you know, yeah, it, it was the right move in the end. I, I did it well enough. I started the following season really well and Harry took me to, I got a couple of goals in the first game, I think, against Luton, although he got beat. And then um, um, I went to West Ham again, which was, again, great fun and yeah. with a lot of good players there. And Harry had, Harry, had a good but good mix. Mark Mark Reapers, Slavin Bilic, Dixie, you know, Ian Bishop, John Monker, Paul Kitson, you know, Hartson. 
you know, then you get you had a few wow. of the few of the foreign lads to it. You know, you think about Hugo Porfirio and Radachoyu and uh, oh, there's some t- t- Dimitrescu, incredible Palo Futre for a period, staggering people. Um, so yeah, some real talent. Ian, who, who's the biggest character you play with? Because I mean, I'm thinking of sort of five or six. Thinking, how do you choose between these these guys? Well, ca- the biggest character was well, difficult to say. I mean, listen, Terry Hurley was an immense character at Southampton. Julian Dix was a. I, got, I had a fantastic relationship with Julian. Started a bit frosty, but when we sort of um, had, a, had an eye to eye once or twice in training and in the, in the boot room, we 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 soon sorted that out. And in the end, we, uh, he was he was a big big character. So a lot of them, you know, really good. I mean. You think about it, it's very difficult to pick between who's the best character in lots of ways. You know, Johnny Monco is an incredible character in around the dressing room, funny, witty, good player as well, technically good. You had, I mean, Slav was a great character, smoked yeah. like a chimney and liked his espressos <laughs> up by, by the bucket load. So, you know, so many different characters in lots of ways, difficult to pick. I mean, I had an yeah. affinity for Terry because he was my sort of lad. He was a, yeah. a lad who'd come from a working class family and in a rough area and done great for himself and played at my team. I love Rangers. He played there. So me and him always got very close. So yeah, big character. If you had to push me, I'd probably say Tell was one of the biggest characters I played with. And, you know, he'd be honest to enough to say he wasn't the greatest player, but I tell you what, he was a really good player. He was technically yeah. really good, but a lot bigger than people give him credit for. And I, you know, the same as me, I would say I was technically not a good player, but you know, Terry was better technically than I was. He had some, a lot of good things about him. I want to fast forward three years because you've, yeah. moved, you've moved across from East London to West London at QPR, but not only as a player, yeah. but also as a, a player coach. Now, was, was, was well, coaching always part of your plans then, was it? Or? Well, I'd always done, I'd done my badges, always wanted yeah. to do it. I was, I, was, I was a voracious you know, reader of, and, and watcher of games and all sorts of things. I liked to you know, study and learn, and so that sort of thing came close to me. My dad was an engineer, my brother was an engineer, so we saw my brother was, was 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 I think by that time was a, I think an FA co- uh, coach for Hertfordshire. So I'd done my badges, and I'd, I think I'd done my pro license by that time. Uh, sorry, my A license I had by that time. And he came across. He just said, "I want you to take the forwards." Ray Harford said it. Would you believe? I said, um, "What? You signed me for, to play." He said, "Well, you might do a bit of that." But anyway, so while he was there, I um, I coached. And then when Jerry, he unfortunately didn't stay too long. She had a bad run of results. Then Jerry Francis took over. He let me. He let me continue in the role and sort of made me let me take the reserves as well. So mm-hmm. I played in the reserves and coached, which was a, was brilliant. The only thing was that also part of that was Terror Tuesday, which was the hardest running I've ever done in my life on a Tuesday. And it always it, it, it was like box to box, halfway line, box to box, halfway line, be one run. So all the way out the pitch and back box to box, halfway line back up to you know, one run. You do 12 of them in, on time. And, that was, and then we had some sprints. It was, it was and it called, we called it Terror Tuesday. And trouble is, it always worked with four, eight, 12, 16, 20. And there was always 11, 11, 15 or 19. So it was always muggings. We had to join in with the, to make up the four. So it was, it was quite bizarre. But I learned an awful lot with Jerry. Amazingly good with me. Let me sort of cut my teeth in, in coaching. Allow me to watch his structuring. And then... Um, you know, in the end, uh, I, I got a chance to go to um, to go to to go to Oldham, which was a, mm. a you know something. And you know, we, we've lived up this this area for a long while now. But yeah, it was really good. I enjoyed it. A bit unusual because the manager was someone I didn't know, Mick Wadsworth. But you know, he was happy to take me on board. I, you know, in the end, I took over from the following year because you know, of the women of the chairman who wasn't. I've got to say, one of the greatest chairman in the world and. You know, in the end, I found that the following year, even though we got in the playoffs, I, I got them in the playoffs. We got beat by QPR, sold all my players from under me in the summer. So we were in administration and then left the club. So the club went into administration. That's sort of August till December period I was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a difficult time before I went to Palace. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you, you highlighted that because it was due to the financial reasons you decided to sort of part ways and, and you were given yeah. the opportunity at Palace. But, I mean, let's talk about when you, you did join Palace because you're a fairly new coach. You've picked up a morally low side, placed 19th in, in you know, yeah. Division 1, which is today's championship, and you completely take over and transform this squad and went on a, 
remarkable 17 match unbeaten run. What did you do? I mean, what, sort of, what was your philosophy behind coaching? Did you have an idea when, as a player, thinking, I'm going to coach and I want to sort of coach and manage in a certain yeah. way? Because this was really like your, you're still quite early in your management career. Yeah, it was. I agree. But I think, I think, I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at the players you've got. I don't think you can come in and impose a structure mm. on players. You've got to, they've, that's got to be developed around the staff you have. Yeah. And I walked in there and the first day, we, to be fair, we lost our first game at home to Mill, which was a big loss, 1-0. Yeah. I've got to say, Dennis Wise was kind enough to say, you battered us, but we still got beat 1-0. And, and the chairman, Mr. Jordan, was very happy at the time. And I understood why, but we played really well. So, I, But when I watched us play that day and watched us training that week, I'm thinking, there's a lot of good people here. Aki mm. Rialati, Michael Hughes, Julian Gray, um, Wayne Routledge, Tony Popovich, you know, um, Danny Butterfield, Danny Granville. You know, good, good players. Neil Shipley, Andy Johnson, Doogie Friedman, real good players. Mm. Clinton Morrison, good players in and around the club. So anyway, I, you know, the chairman was unhappy. We had some words. I said, listen, give it, you can come back in a month and talk to me. Anyway, we went on some incredible unbeaten run. I think we won seven, six or seven in a row. Won 18 out of the 26 remaining. We got ourselves in the playoffs. And then by fortune, really, because we drew at Coventry, we batted Coventry, we drew to all and relied on a Brian Dean goal at uh, Wigan to get us in the playoffs, which was disappointing. But nonetheless, still an incredible opportunity. And then to go back to my philosophy, we trained very hard. I had, a, I had one of the first, I had a management group in the, within the team that come to me and told me about my training and my coach's training and our fitness. And the first thing they said, we've got to get rid of Terror Tuesday, which I was a lesser, lesser version of Jerry's, which I refused. So, they, you know, they weren't going to get it all their own way. But we were we were quite, you know, we, we, we did a lot of swimming with them. We did you know, a lot of recovery. There were long days. We had a Wednesday was our individual day where I'd take from 9.15 to 10 o'clock and then 10.15 to 11 o'clock and have 45 minutes one on one. Get to know them, get to know what they're about, improve their ability, try and, and that really went well. So to getting close to them, it worked particularly well. And listen, get a good, be a good manager. Get good players, be a great manager, get great players. Let me be honest, the players deserve a huge amount of success. They found a way to look into their soul after a big defeat, I think, to Reading or something, and they, and they found a way back. And in the end, they got us in the Premier League by their sheer determination. Listen, we had Michael Hughes and, and Andy Johnson at the very heart of them, and Tony Popovich and the likes. I added a few, Mark Hudson from Fulham, who done brilliant for us. But, you know, a lot of really good players, Neil Shipley, outstanding people. Outstanding men in different ways. Some leaders like Aki and, and Michael Hughes, some not leaders, but like uh, Wayne Routledge and Julian Gray, but outstanding players. And we deserved it. We were good, very good. We were, we were difficult to play against. We beat Stoke six, I think, at one stage when, when it was unheard of doing that. Um, six two, I think, on our way to the playoffs. We then beat Sunderland home, four three at home, and then got an eight, two one. We lost the way and then found a way to get us in the penalty shoot at the end and got through on penalties and then beat my team West Ham in the final so and very much the underdogs I mean we were massive I think one to ten at some one stage to, to win it because they had players but we had a resilience we had a grittiness we had we could find a way I mean one game that sticks in my mind is Leeds away I think we were tenth at the time but going upwards they were sixth going really well we went away there we beat them one nil it was a war it was a war and we could do it either way. We could play great football, but we could go to war. Maybe Sean Derry played that night and he was outstanding. I think alongside Aki, because Michael Hughes was injured, he was outstanding, you know, in that. He's, he was a warrior in there. So, you know, just little things spring to my mind and we, we could win both ways. So very proud of that team. Um, very proud of everything. But it's about, listen, you, you put a structure in place. It's about players. The players were outstanding. Ian, at the end of that third season at Palace, you yeah. you seemed to leave by mutual consent, but that wasn't the end of it, was it? No, 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 no. It wasn't. Like, listen, Richard. Yeah, I went to Charlton. Yeah, I don't forget the season before but we, mm. when we went, we got relegated. The last day we got relegated at Charlton, and there was some sense that Charlton behaved poorly, which I don't remember really. Anyway, yeah. nonetheless, I suppose it wasn't the greatest decision of mine to leave Palace and go to Charlton. And, and, and not that it was a big rivalry at the time, but it's become a, it became a bigger rivalry. Anyway, so in the essence of that, that was a decision. Maybe looking back on it, you do something different. But Richard Murray was very good for me as a chairman. My mistake at Charlton was I didn't win enough games, so you get sacked. Fact. Can't mm -hmm. change that. I, I should have brought my own staff with me. 
Although Mark Robson, who was there, was brilliant. He was fantastic. I should have brought my own staff with me. The Palace situation was, as soon as I'd gone for that job, he, he, he'd taken me to court. And as a result, he ended up in high court, which was very mm. harrowing. So nowhere around it. A little bit of a strange decision from a you know a club I'd done so well with and made a load mm. of money for the chairman and the club as a, as a rule to treat you in that fashion, even though he agreed to let me leave. Anyway, the, the, the fact of the matter is, it, it's what it was. Not my greatest decision to go to Charlton. Not because Charlton was a good club. I've got great respect for both clubs, but maybe... The rivalry is a bit closer than I thought because of us going down there. Yeah. Although, you know, our big rivalry was was Millwall, really, and Brighton. So, anyway, it's what it is. Not an easy thing to overcome. But what I can do is I know that I can look back at my time at Palace and really outside the relegation, nothing but a successful period where not only did I turn around a lot of the players, but, you know, we had sold Andy Johnson. I think it was a 500 grand buy for 10.6 million, I think, to mm. to... Everton players went on to good things and that's amazing. You know, it's not about making money. We didn't have a load of investment in the Premier League, but my time there was virtually unblemished other than the fact of the relegation, which 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 we all wish we could have done better. And we certainly would have done, I think, with, with a bit more uh, investment. But nonetheless, you know, the players couldn't have done any more. So, yeah, not, yeah. The, not the finest decision to take. And maybe in hindsight, something you do different. But, you know, you can't hide away. I didn't win enough games at Charlton. You get sacked. It's what happens. Yeah. The Palace thing is what it is. You know, someone who's a lit- who was a very litigious person likes that and that he went down that route and so it became that way. Yeah, well, some of the players that you mentioned there, I actually told them you're coming on the pod today and they all speak very fondly of you. So you're incredibly liked and well thought of by the by the people at the club, mate. So I appreciate that. Um, you went on to Charlton, Coventry, QPR. Anything you want to sort of share with us? And- well, Coventry was a great one, really. I mean, it, it, listen, to be fair, no, you won't know this, but Paul Fletcher was the chairman and he resigned in the summer. So I, they mm. were they were rock, near rock bottom and I, we won six out of seven games, kept them up. And, you know, it was Operation Premier League. It never turned out to be. And he resigned in the summer because of it. Wow. And then uh, I, I, it, there was a takeover, different owner. We never really seen eye to eye and I moved on. But Paul Fletcher resigned because he he brought me there on the premise that... We were going to go if we got if we stayed up, we'd really be going for it, and that was never the case. So I brought Scott Dan in and Danny Fox in, good players, and you know they they were soon moved on and sold on. So it was it became a fire sale. The new owner wanted to be part of that uh, money ball type thing where he, he, I had no problem with money ball twenty one year olds. You know if if if, if you got, if you're on top of the stats as a twenty seven year old playing in Rafe Rovers in Scotland in League Two, and you're coming to the Championship in uh, you're going to be a you're going to be a t- you're soon not going to be a championship club. And, yeah. you know, unfortunately I left and uh, I think Chris Coleman took over me and I, I, mm. I, I made a call to him. I'm big friends with Chris and uh, yeah, he found it exactly the same. So, you know, they're, they're, they're a terribly difficult period. They've got a great manager now in Mark Rollins who's doing a fantastic job, yeah, yeah. but difficult time there, difficult time. But I loved it. I really did. I really enjoyed it. They're fantastic. So, you know, that that little period where we play, I think Wolves at home, we beat them 2-1. There was 32,000 there. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. It sounds to me like you've got some unfinished business in management, Ian, because you speak yeah, well, so that's passionately about it. Talk yeah, well, I, it's my biggest love. I mean, people talk about I love coaching more than playing. I, you know, I'll, I'll always want. I'll always love football. Football's my big love in life. Yeah. And so, you know, my, my two my two boys are a little bit the same. Fortunately, they love football. And we Saturdays a house is filled with screaming and shouting and bits and pieces and our referee and all that type of stuff. But, but. As I've got to go back to the fact my biggest love is coaching, no doubt. Well, I can say on behalf of the nation, we all enjoy watching you on yeah. Soccer soccer Saturday on Sky Sports, Ian, but we would definitely love to see you back in the stadium. Yeah, well, I'd love to be there. Okay, so, good. Well, look, before we conclude the first half of the pod, we did actually chuck some questions out on our social media platforms and we've yep. got a, a quick fire round for you. So, yep. number one, unfortunately, was managing or playing, but it sounds like you've already answered Managing. That yeah, managing. Who was your boyhood hero? I mean, bizarrely, although it sounds bizarre because I think I'm, I'm a similar age to him. Norman Whitesworth was a big hero of mine. Oh, yeah. People don't forget, if you ever look at his goal scoring record at Man United when he was there, it was quite incredible. So being Northern Irish, I mean, obviously I'm a massive fan of George Best. Yeah, but probably, you know, um, Billy Bonds was was probably my hero, if I'm honest. Yeah, he was a West Ham fan. So, Okay, number four. The best player you've played with, Ian? With? Well, it's true. listen, it's very difficult to say that. I've set lots of good players at the international level. 
I think at the, at the peak of his powers, I mean, Alan Shearer was an incredible talent, but still developing into what he became. So probably as a result of that, Matt Letizio would be some way, although yeah. Michael Hughes pushes him and pushes him close. Yeah. Uh, okay. Michael was very good, but I'd say Matt Letizio. Okay. The best player you've played against? Oh, Zidane. Wow. When was that? Actually, actually, maybe I said something that was true there. Well, I think Zidane may have come on at that game. And then France played Northern Ireland, they were on the tour. I'll tell you what, did, did we, we played against Butcher, Butcher Guaino for Spain. It was incredible. And I played against, it was incredible talent in that in that team. We played against Yugoslavia away. We got beat four, I think four or five, one. Some of the players here, Darko Panchev, incredible player. You know, I couldn't be believe the ability, of, you know. So probably though, I probably, I probably have to say in terms of quality, was Zidane, yeah. I wasn't expecting that one. A club you wish you played for, but you never did. Rangers. Favourite goal you scored? <laughs> Sounds like, well, probably the easy way. It's, it's, it's probably is my favourite goal. I've scored a, a better one. It's one against Neil Ruddock at, at Tottenham when he was giving me all those sorts of chips, sent me a picture <laughs> of him studying me in the back and I volleyed one in the top corner to win 2-1. It was a great goal. And one ride, my shirt ripped at Palace. Can't remember yeah. you remember, it was on the front page of the Sun, cover my shirt <laughs> off. I scored a volley, but, the, probably my favourite goal is at Lansdowne Road. So I scored, we we drew one all with the Republic of Ireland. I scored the goal. And that was the first goal we'd scored there. So um, that was probably my favourite. wasn't much of a goal because Keith Gillespie put it on a plate for me, but it was a decent head. I'd put it past the keeper and um, great ball from Keith Gillespie. Was that the proud? Was that the proudest moment of your career? Before, yeah, I think it, it was. I yeah. mean, the proudest moment yeah. was probably captain in Northern Ireland, which was amazing. I'm a, I, I, you know, the proudest moment of my playing career was that. The proudest moment of my, uh, my professional life has been taking Palace to the league one, the playoff final, winning that game. Cool. This is an interesting one. The best coach at the moment, would you say? Wow. In the league? Yeah. It doesn't have to be the Premier League. It could be... No. no. Mm -hmm. Let me think. Best coach. Well, I've got to say, as we speak now, it's very, I think people say, but as we speak now, and I think he's, he's had an epiphany. I, I think... So it's either transformed, I'd say Pep Guardiola, because yeah. I think he's found a way to find a resilience about them. I mean, of course, it's recruitment with Diaz, but he's playing all different players. You can't score against them. There's a much more pragmatic style. They beat Sheffield United the other day, and I, was, I did the game live, and they kept the ball in the corner with 12 minutes to go. Would you believe that? I mean, you wouldn't have believed that. But, no. you know, nonetheless, they won the game, didn't concede a goal, hadn't conceded, goodness knows, now long. Oh, you've got to say, I'm a great mind of Mourinho as well, don't forget. I love him and I love Klopp. I mean, I was, this time last year, Klopp by a long way. And I'm not blaming Klopp because he's got injuries. I just think what Pep's done has got him back at the top of the tree. And so, you know, he's an amazing... And I've seen him coach a couple of times live. He's quite... It's staggering what he does. It's And so does Klopp. It's difficult to get them patterns of play going forward. He does it brilliantly. Just a personal question. Yep. Last one. Yep. What's, your, what's your golf handicap? 14. Well, we'll hopefully see about that in a few weeks' time. I bet you better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>23 and a Room half. the view then, was it? Well, I don't feel right. It's not far from the just about. But, you know, it was a lovely little house. And in the end, um, my, me and my now wife, uh, I bought it with a different partner. By that time, by, by the time I moved into it, I actually lived with it. Yeah. I was with a different person. So, um, my wife now. So, um, it was, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. So, Foster's Green. Remember it well. We spent a lot of our, we did it, you know, when we moved in, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Good fun. Testing, you know, as you know, well, yeah, when you're yeah. moving with someone you're going to live with for a while, yeah. it's just a testing period. So, yeah, it was good. So, 
some of the some of the shouting from me or her was drowned out by the um the airplanes by the by the um the airplanes yeah yeah okay so look i mean you played for seven different different clubs uh in your career yeah. where where did you stay whilst you were at each one because we helped so many different players whether they yeah. gone on loan or whether they're going to buy somewhere i'm intrigued well, to know your story it's bizarrely well, for a long time i've been up a long time I, until i got the management jobs so i moved around i really based myself around half in the I had a lovely place in Harpen that I enjoyed and West Common, which I loved there, which I still never got rid of. And then bizarrely, when I'm in my coaching career, when I move up to the Northwest, rather than keep my house, I then go sell my house and move up there, which I'm now, you know, I'm now settled. I'm happy. But at the time, that was a strange decision. But I thought at the time, you have to show willing to be living there. You know what I mean? So we moved up Lock, Stock and Barrel. The boys end up going to Bolton School and... Um, you know, and a, lot, a lot of that's come on and that's, you know, it's just been a great school for them. And we we love living where we live. We now move somewhere else. It's a bit more modern and, and bits and pieces. So really only had, we moved into a, another house while we were building this latest one room. We've only been in really sort of West Common Way, just off um, Bolton, a uh, Chorley New Road, just off Chorley New Road. And then a little bit of a rental place before I'm in a place now. So really three houses, three major houses in my life, really. When you was at Luton, did you sell that house at Luton before you then moved to West Ham? No, just just uh, I moved from the house at the, at the end of the runway to a house in try to name of the village, stops near Stopsley anyway, in sort of heart, between Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire, okay. just there. I bought a little a new house, then I sold that and moved to West Common Way. And so okay. then when I went to West Ham, I was living in West Common Way. Okay, and how about Southampton? Southampton, we lived in a rented place in Ocean Village. Oh, right. So you, okay. Yeah. Well, I know that well. So you rented there for the five seasons that you were there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you? Yeah. And you didn't think about buying? Did you want to buy? No, no, no. We like where we live. We live there. So, you know what I mean? It's a nice place, you know, so it's what it was. I think I, I can't exactly remember when we, we bought West Common Way, but, you know, it took a bit, it was a bit of a project to do up. So it took some time. Okay. So how many properties do you own now, if you don't mind me asking? I own three. Okay. So the two that you had previously, you've kept? No, no, no. I have no. I've got my new house, my my house I've built. I've got yeah. a flat in Manchester. That's actually I'm not we're not gonna be on for much longer because I'm gonna remember my son's gonna have that. And then we I've got a place that I bought as an investment in Razul Kaima. That's it, that's all I've got. Okay. Can we talk about your investments and what you do yeah. as a good investment? Tell me talk me through those. How did you find well, them? What did you what did you buy it for? What what did you rent it out at? Yeah, well listen. Investment wise, I've, I've not been too clever with that. I've got to say, listen, my view is I had the best investment I had, if you like, probably was buying on, on the palm. So I had a place on the palm. So I bought that very early. So I get my, my dad, we lived in the Middle East when I was 12 in three years from Abu Dhabi. So Dubai was, so I was in Dubai years ago when there was one, was, was nothing there. So we, we ended up, we were quite early. We got into a flat on the, on the palm that I kept for a long while and then eventually, end up selling when I, was, when I was built this house. So that was quite a good investment. That worked well. We rented it out for, can't remember what it was at the time, but decent rent, but we'd, it was good because we left it in the summer and we went in. The only trouble is, as you know, it's that hot in the summer. It's, it's difficult to go back. So now would be perfect because I could use it much more and the kids could go and use it, but that's gone now. So we'll, um, the, 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 the Razzle Kaima one was just a off plan. A, a couple of lads bought some, bought serious numbers of them. So, they were good little investments. It will make it's really not boomed away. So it's it's made no money in terms of what we pay for it. It's probably exactly worth what we pay for it. And it's really rented its rental values next to nothing because it's hasn't picked up like Dubai. So that one's not been a good investment. Um the one in Manchester's been rented all the time. Again, not massive. I didn't pay a lot for it. It's been good, been totally rented, I think, for eight, nine, ten years. Mm. So eight about eight hundred and ninety quid to rent that, something like that, I think. Well, it's on Media City, so is it yeah okay do you regret not buying more during your career yeah well listen in lots of ways i mean one thing i was always very careful was with my pension so i invested in that but you're right you know Good. my view is i always think there was a couple of things that that, that i had that, 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 that went wrong but you know that that ability to have something in case things go wrong i mean i've been fortunate enough to stumble into a different profession you know after this that could not happen to some people so mm. yeah i think i do been nice to maybe have had a couple of places, you know, which have got somewhere where you could go and maybe visit in the lakes or maybe Cornwall, whatever it happened to be where. Mm. But now mm. you go and use it all the time. So, 
yeah, I think it's a really clever thing. I also think it's, it's very clever to get somewhere where you can rent out and maybe build that. You've seen lots of very more prominent footballers than me do it. I think, it's, I think if you go at a level, and you, you know the level better than me, a lot better than me, and do it very well, that, that, I think it's a level you can't really get burnt. And I think that's a clever thing because if you overstretch yourself, that's what where you can. Whereas at that level, you're never really overstretching yourself. So, yeah, regrets, but not not too much because, you know, we're, we're, we're quite happy in asking. Yeah, good for you, mate. Well, look, just out of interest, I was just... Was there anyone that you can remember during your playing career that had like a real appetite for property? It was almost sort of their yeah. thing and you were sort of thinking, yeah. well... Steve Williams. He was the guy, was he? Yeah, he used, to, he used to build... I mean, listen, he bought a house in the New Forest. I'm not being funny... At the time, if you ever if you ever go back and have a look, some of the houses he built houses I'd never seen the like of. I mean, he had obviously had a great career, much better than mine, but he was a top draw player. And he and he came into my house one day, he turned down the heat, it's too hot in here. There's one of them lads. And to be fair, that didn't go down well with me, as you can imagine. But <laughs> I said, listen, sit down, eat your dinner, and well, I'll have my house how I like it. But it, I got on well with him. He was he was big into his property. As were some of the other lads. I mean, you know, some of the other lads had had bits and pieces around the country in terms of doing it, but. Steve Williams sticks in my mind because he liked there were statement pieces. He, he was he, he, what he was very good at was finding land on the back of plots of you know plots of other houses that you know could go and buy a plot of land off a house existing. Another you know in them days I suppose in New Forest four or five acres in New Forest he'd take a two of them keep it build something massive put hedges and trees so he'd never be seen and you know you, you'd never see your neighbour. So just you know I suppose I was a bit sort of cut by that but never really. If I'm honest, now, although I'm in property now, I've never really been into it in a big, big way, Lee, if I'm honest. And never, probably, if I, if, listen, I've had a bump to you when I, when I was, because I was always a thoughtful person, a bump to you when I was 32 and, you know, mm. maybe coming, I would have, I would have definitely done some of them 50 to 70s and get all, get all over them because, you know, it's, it's a nice little way to, to, to have something, you know, an ancillary income that builds and builds and builds. Yeah, and and I know we're working together with Alexandra Grace, and and you guys are doing an absolutely fantastic job for all of our players. In in your opinion, how important is it for professional sports people to consider property as a as a form of investment? Looking back at your career, and, and also in light of of what you're doing now. Yeah, well, my view is, I think you're safe in bricks and mortar. Mm-hmm. All right, listen, I'm, I'm a, wait, wait, listen, my son's a, my son's an investment banker in the city. Okay. And, that, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a big job he's got, very high pressure. And, you know, and listen, I consider myself quite well educated. When he talks to me about the job he's doing and the, the mathematical nature of it and the, the way in which he has to hedge it and set it off mm-hmm. and, and, and do it and redo it and three times do it and cover his bases. In the end, in an area that people need to live in, people will always need houses. You know, you know, what, you know what sort of income you're going to get in it. In the end... You're never going to lose much on it, even if you know. Even in, I think in this market now, if you're buying at what 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 you do, Lee, it's it's a it's a it's a clever business. If you're buying, you know, in a couple of hundred and above, that's a different market because you've got big mm-hmm. losses. When you when you mm-hmm. when you're lower than that, you're in a, you're in a good position. So, yes, I think it's rightly important. Bricks and mortar will never let you down, and people need, and people. I think there'll be more people renting than ever. I've got to say that. You know, mm-hmm. that's that, and that's me. I hate to say that, but. There's going to be a shock to the economy and tragically, there's going to be an awful lot of people unemployed. And yeah. as a result, you know, property, you know, turnovers and people getting repossessed and all them things and evictions will become a little bit too commonplace, which will break will breaks everyone's heart in this modern day. But it's going to happen, I think, just because of the sheer severity of, the, of, the, of this crisis. And it is a crisis. Yeah, I know. Ian, you came into professional football fairly late on. Yeah. Um, did you ever get any property education at any of the clubs that you played for? Because no. we, 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 we no. provide a lot of clubs, particularly sort of under 23s with these sort of uh, lifestyle property workshops now. Was that something that you would have ever have heard of when you were no. playing? Nothing. No, really? if, if it had been done, it had been off the back of a player. You know, uh-huh. you always, not being funny, there was a... T- there was a few tricky dickies and all that, but it'd been someone led like, listen, obviously an educated players and Danny Wilson and the like would have said, listen, make sure you get your money in your pension, look mm. after it, make sure if you mm. want some property, this is my mate's doing this, the cheap houses, you can buy them and rent them out. You know, there was that sort of thing. But other than that, no, I never had done it. I had one. And by the time, you know, I was very, because I had to be very much f- focused on just football. I just did that. And it's, it's the way it turned out. But 
listen, it's it's marvelous. There's 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 much more education about that today, and even even at that, you know, it's this is not about you know this this. I, I think what you're doing what works well. Of course, it applies to people at higher level, but it also it really applies to people at you know League Two, League One, uh, Championship. You know, uh, younger players do their thing early on, get some a bit of a base. It's mm. such a comfort blanket for you because some of them won't have an won't know what to do other than coaching. That, but that doesn't, it won't happen for everyone. Someone no. won't come just because you've had a great career. Doesn't mean you're going to a great coaching career. You may mm-hmm. not be able to, and you may not be earning in the championship. Let's say the league one. You may not be earning. You may be earning two or three grand a week. All of a sudden, this career finishes. You're used to earning, you know, let's say, 150 grand a year. You go from, and suddenly something that goes. Well, yeah. Where where do you go to replace that income? Yeah. You know that's yeah. the key. You've got you got to be clever enough to know that and being foresighted enough. Not everyone is, and as a result, they need education to do it. So workshop, you can't, you can't striving for. To, who wouldn't want to listen to something that possibly can help them? You yeah. know, worst case you say you can stop for me. The best case is, is yeah, it is for me. Let me think about it. I can't afford the hundred grand, the seventy grand. I can try. Yeah. I can afford the fifty grand. Whatever it happens to be, find a way to fit 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 yourself into it, and that's what's yeah. key about it. Yeah, definitely. I, th- I think there's like a strategy for everybody, really. It doesn't matter what agree. salary you're on. When yeah. when you were managing, did you ever liaise with, I don't know, say your head of education about what the what available workshops were coming through? Yes. Did you? Education, what the PFA did at the time, what you're doing, the pension was and all them things, and, and that's where you are. So it was a massive thing for me to get involved with. So I did do that, yeah. I, I'll put it over to my head of education. Some of them, some of the clubs I was involved, don't forget, wasn't very, very good. So, you know, I mean, we didn't have great resources at Oldham particularly, but I made sure the players that sat down and, and looked at it for sure. Well, look, listen, Ian, thank you so much for coming on the pod today. I've absolutely loved it. Um, I'm really enjoying working with you, uh, Alexandra Grace. Yep. I think what you're doing as a new business director is absolutely first class, genuinely. And we're going to continue to recommend you to all of our sports people looking to buy property. So thanks again for your support. Just out of interest, just, um, just confirm for me, if somebody wants to reach out to Alexandra Grace, where are they going? Yeah, they can go to just send me an email. Catch me on um, LinkedIn. Yeah, some ID at Alexandra Grace hyphen law dot co dot uk. Listen, it's been a pleasure working with you, Lee. It's nothing but easy. You've got you, you definitely have the clients very much front and center uh, what you're doing. That someone who is it's, it's not it's not about you know what you're doing for what you're doing to earn. It's about doing what's best for them. You know, it's just, it's, it's been, you know, even with sort of the fact that you negotiating the legal fee down with us, which, which is all part of it. No, but I'm joking, but it's a serious point, you know, so, you know, it's, it's been pleasure working with you. Long may that continue. Thank well, thank you very much, mate. We take massive pride in what we do. And listen, you know, we'll, you ask, we're all going to be sort of good people. It's only going to help them in their career. Ian, listen, mate, I know you're super busy. You've got loads to do. Yep. Thank you again for everything, mate. And we'll, uh, Tom we'll catch up very soon. We'll, get, we'll catch you game soon. Test your handicap. <laughs> Test your handy. My, mine's going up. Yeah, yeah, all right. Take care, mate. <laughs> you too, Ian. Thanks, mate. Yeah, man. Bye. Bye. Ta-da, mate. You've been listening to Talk Sport and Property. Visit the App Store and download the MPH Sports app today or keep up with us over on Instagram.